Well, good morning. My name is Reverend Dr. Matt Stone. I'm the lead pastor here at Mount Pisgah and honored to be in worship with you today as we begin a new series called Community with a Cause. But before we get to that, uh, I want to say just a quick word about the events in Appalachia this week, at Appalachia High School this week. Uh, listen, this, this is what I want to tell you. This is what I feel like God has put on my heart for us today. Prayer was never meant to be the end. Prayer was never meant to be the end of the story. Prayer is always a catalyst. Either we are praying that God would do something, or we're praying so that God might speak in us that we might do something, or both. It was never intended to be the end. We can all agree that there is a problem with gun violence, particularly related to schools in this country right now, even if we don't agree on the solution. But perhaps it is time to stop talking about how wrong the other team is and begin working on implementing the solution that we think might make the world reflect just a little bit more, the world that God desires. I don't know what that looks like for you. The truth is, the world is rarely as binary as the politicians and the media make it out to be. Perhaps there is some truth to both sides of this debate. I don't know. But what I am finished with is the notion that the followers of Jesus have completed our duty because we have prayed. No, we've begun our duty because we've prayed. That's my hope for us, that we might start working and stop talking about it. Now, speaking of politicians, it's a great way to start a sermon, by the way. I had lunch recently with one of our local elected officials. We had a great lunch. I really enjoyed the conversation. We spent most of the time talking about the joys and challenges of family and parenting. But at the end of that lunch, I asked, uh, I asked my new friend, hey, what are the biggest challenges that you can see in our area? What are the biggest challenges? And I don't mean things like infrastructure, though that certainly can be a challenge. I don't mean things like Uh, uh, rules and regulations. I mean, what are the biggest challenges that you see from your position that keep people from living the life that we know God wants them to live? And so he thought about it for a minute, and then he says something that I have not stopped thinking about. He said that he believes the greatest challenge facing our area, facing John's Creek, is connection. That because of our addiction to devices, which, by the way, is not a young person's game, Right? We are also addicted to the devices that hang on our walls and loop a 24-hour news cycle. This isn't a young person's addiction. This is a cultural addiction to our devices. Because of that and because of the increasing polarization around us, the way this person sees it, connection or the lack thereof, is the greatest challenge facing our specific area right now. And then he went on to talk about some of the things that he's trying to do to address that, which I loved hearing uh, an election, uh, an elected official talk about some things that they're working on that might make a difference in the emotional and spiritual lives of the people in their area. I love that, but I walked away from that lunch thinking about what we could be. I walked away thinking about what we should be. I walked away thinking about what we are called to be as the church. As we think about the church right now, particularly as November approaches, especially in the aftermath of this week's events, which are too close to home for us, as we think about the church, what happens within these, within these walls isn't all there is. What happens within these walls can't be all there is. For us as the church. It just cannot be. God surely is calling us to something beyond these walls. And we hear it in scripture so many different times in so many different ways, right? We hear Jesus talking to Peter, the rock, saying, I'm going to build the church on you and it's going to have such strength that even the gates of hell will not prevail against it. We hear the apostle Paul talking in Ephesians 2, saying that the Spirit of God, the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, is the Spirit that will live in 
the church, as we take those images, as we look at what Scripture has to say, it's inescapable for me that the church is the chosen instrument of God for the transformation of the world. We don't exist simply to exist. We exist to do for the sake of the kingdom of God. We are a community with a cause. It's inescapable. And that cause, by the way, there's a purpose for which we exist. That cause is not that we might have more people on Sunday mornings, as much fun as that would be. The cause for which we exist is not that we might have greater financial capacity, as comfortable as that might be. The cause for which we exist as the church is far grander and far more important than internal growth. And that's exactly what I'm excited to spend the next couple of weeks exploring as we think about who we are as a church. We are indeed a community with a cause. As we begin that conversation, I think the most natural uh, beginning place for me uh, is, is an image that the Apostle Paul deploys in a few different places And I want to remind you, because there are folks who are new to Scripture, there are folks who are new to church, who might rightly ask, yes, but why should we care what the Apostle Paul had to say about what the church is? And I think that's a great question that I want to speak to for just a minute, if I can. The Apostle Paul, if you're not familiar with his story, uh, was perhaps responsible more than any other human besides Jesus for the explosive growth of the church in the first century. Think about it this way. Over the course of nine or ten years, he made three missionary journeys, traveled around 10,000 miles in the first century, around 10,000 miles, planted probably more than 14 churches, just a tremendous influence. And as he planted those churches, many of you know this, he wrote letters to those churches, those letters. We still have some of those letters that comprise a significant portion of what we call the New Testament. In fact, 48% of the books in the New Testament are letters that the Apostle Paul wrote to his churches. If you think about it a different way, 23% of the word count of the New Testament is the Apostle Paul. Did you know, by the way, that Luke wrote more words than Paul? I never think about it that way. But the Gospel of Luke, together with the book of Acts, which Luke also wrote, comprises 27% of the word count of the New Testament. But I'm going to say one more thing about that. If you take out the story of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, right? If you take out the, the four Gospels then what remains is the story of the growth of the early church. What remains is the early church. And of those writings, Paul represents 53.6% of the words. That's a lot. I think perhaps it makes sense for us to pay particular attention to what the Apostle Paul had to say. Not only was he responsible for such a tremendous amount of that growth, but his writings were so powerful, were so important in the life of the early church that they were preserved and elevated as coming not only from Paul, but co-authored by the Holy Spirit. When the Apostle Paul has something to say about who we are, it behooves us, as my seventh grade English teacher was fond of saying, it behooves us to slow down and pay attention. Because what he has to say carries significant weight. When he offers an image of what the church is, we need to pay attention. And that's exactly what he does in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 12. If you have your Bibles this morning, I want to encourage you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. You have it on your your phone, you can do that too. But we're going to spend the entirety of this morning. What? most of this morning in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Remember, this is a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Corinth. This is a church that Paul planted, uh, and Corinth was a city that was characterized by just tremendous wealth. They're highly educated people, but they're also a pagan folk who live in a profound sense of immorality. And all of that that added up to some deep uh, division and tension and conflict. That was the, one of the reasons why Paul is writing a letter. He wants to speak to and offer counsel to the church as they consider what it means for them to deal with the tension and conflict that's welling up inside their church. And so that's where we're going to pick up the story in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, In verse 12, for just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. It's the most confusing sentence. 
perhaps because I'm using the New Revised Standard Version, which I'll admit is an old version of the Bible. I just can't get rid of it because it's the sacred scripture to me. So let me see if we can make this a little simpler. If you're reading out of the NIV or perhaps another version of the Bible, this may already be apparent to you. But what Paul is deploying is an image or a metaphor for the church that is the body of Christ. He's saying you are the body of Christ as a whole, but you are also individually members of that body, members of that whole, because you are knit together in Christ. And he goes on, he says, for in the one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we are all made to drink of the one spirit. Paul deploys a very common image to begin describing or continue describing what the church actually is. He says, you are the body of Christ. That image of a body was not one that Paul just made up. This is a common image used in the ancient world to describe how a community works together. But in the ancient world, it was also used to describe how there are some who are more important than others. The head, for instance, the emperor, is more important than the left pinky toe. It's just, and that's, that's who most people are, is the left pinky toe. And so that image of the body was used to put people in their place. Not so with Paul. It's fascinating. He uses that same image to say something tremendously different. He says, actually, we are all part of the body, but we are all joined together by Christ and stand in the same position. But also, when Paul deploys this metaphor of the body, remember that Paul is a Jew's Jew. He is thoroughly Jewish. And there is a lot of conversation, particularly right now, about how Paul thinks of the body. But it's inescapable for me to think about Paul's use of the body without thinking about what he surely has in mind, which is a thoroughly Jewish understanding of what a body actually is. And we can't understand a Jewish understanding of what the body is without returning all the way back to the beginning all the way back to Genesis chapter 1, when we hear that God created mankind, when we hear that God created the body and called it good, we hear a couple of things about the, the cause for which the body existed in Genesis chapter 1. We hear that God created mankind in his image, right? Which is a, another way of saying, another way of translating that is mankind, the body was an idol for God. We're uncomfortable using that language because we're told that idols are bad. But the language in Hebrew is we are idols of God, which means we are earthly representations of a divine reality. Fast forward to Paul. One of the things that Paul is saying when he deploys this image of the body is that we are earthly representations of a divine reality. Right? Paul is using this Jewish, Jewish conception of the body and applying it to the church. We are idols of God. We are earthly representations of a divine reality. And then we also hear in Genesis chapter 1, God's commission to humanity. He says, be fruitful and multiply. And certainly part of the cause for which we exist as a community is the multiplication of of God's kingdom, that the world, because of what God does through this body, through this church, the world is going to hear not the story of Mount Pisgah, but the story of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that the kingdom of God might multiply. Paul is using this Jewish notion of the body and applying it to the body of Christ. And then we hear that uh, back in Genesis chapter 1, we hear God say one more time, and have dominion, subdue the earth and have dominion over it. And let's be clear, I don't think that what God meant, nor Paul meant, is that the body of Christ is to have a dictatorial relationship over the world. I don't think that's what dominion is. I think when Paul deploys this image, when God deploys this image, even in Genesis 1, what he's talking about is less a dictatorship and more a stewardship of the world around us. That this body, this body is called to steward the world around us, that it might produce the fruit that God expects it to produce. The fruit of justice and mercy and peace 
and the love of God and the love of neighbor. That, that is the cause for which we exist. When Paul deploys this metaphor of the body, he's calling us to a a life of representation, representing a divine reality to a world that is hardly aware of it. He's calling us to a life of multiplication that the story of the gospel was never meant to be harbored and sheltered within these walls. It was always meant to multiply and go out. He's calling us to a life of stewardship, of helping the world around us, stewarding it in, stewarding it in such a way that it would produce the fruit that God expects it to produce. That's the metaphor that Paul deploys. We are so, some of us are so familiar with the language of the body of Christ that we forget what Paul means by body. So now let's read that verse one more time. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 12. For just as the body is one and has many members, that word member, by the way, that means organ or limb or member. Just as the body is one and has many organs or limbs or members, all the members of the body, though there's a lot, are one body, just as it is in Christ. And then he goes forward and he offers us a couple of warnings. And I think these are warnings that are crucial for you who are sitting here today. For you who are watching online today, these warnings are crucial, particularly the first one. Here's what he says in verse 14. Indeed, the body doesn't consist of one member, but of many. But of many. If the foot would say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body, that wouldn't make it any less a part of the body. There is a temptation, and Paul is warning us against it. There is a temptation to discount ourselves, to discount ourselves, to say that our part in the body isn't as important, right? Because I'm not the hand, I must not be important. There is a temptation to discount. I I guarantee you, half of you sitting here today are thinking, well, yes, Paul may be driving towards the point that all the members of the body are important, but what Paul doesn't know is how little gifted I am. What Paul doesn't know is how broken I am. What Paul doesn't know is how weak I am. Half of us are already discounting ourselves from the story before we even get started. And what Paul says is it doesn't really matter if you think you aren't a part of the body. You're no less a part of the body. Every one of you possesses a a vital part of the body of Christ. None of you can discount yourself. None of you are are less than in the body of Christ. Every one of you, every part of the body is crucial for vitality, for power, for movement. Every one of you matters. Paul has said it. God has declared it. It's up to you to believe it. And then he offers a second warning. This one is the converse warning. This is down in verse 18, but as it is, God has arranged the members of the body, each one of them as he chose, which by the way, is a powerful statement. Let me just go backward for just a moment. If you are sitting there thinking, yes, but but I don't really have anything to offer the body of Christ. Remember that God is the one who put you here. So for you to say that you don't have anything to offer the body of Christ is to say that God has made a mistake. That God has done something wrong by placing you in this body. And I reject it wholeheartedly. Believing instead that God has called every one of you here to be a vital part of the body of Christ. And he goes on, he says, if all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many members, yet one body. He's reminding us over and over and over again. Yes, we are all individual organs, limbs, members of the body, but we are one together. And then he says, the eye can't say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. This is the second warning. If the first warning is against you discounting yourself, the second warning is against you disqualifying the person next to you. The second warning is a profound warning 
for those of us who have been in the church a little too long, who think perhaps we have figured the whole thing out, who perhaps have have thought, my Christian capacity is so elevated that I am indispensable versus you who are new, who have no idea up from down. The second warning is against disqualifying your neighbor. It cannot be done. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. The foot cannot say to the ear, I don't need you. Every part of the body is crucial for the vitality of the whole. We cannot discount ourselves in that, and we cannot disqualify persons about whom we think less of. Think about what you do when you do that, by the way. You are saying that the person next to you, whom God has placed there, is somehow less than you. Be warned, my friends. We cannot bring that attitude into the work of the church. We cannot bring that perspective to the body of Christ. It is not only unbiblical, it is contrary to who God is and who God created us to be. I'll invite you to read the next couple of verses as you have a chance later this week. And I'll take this opportunity to say this. As we make our way through this passage, it is so rich and so deep that there is no possible way for me to plumb the depths in one sermon of this passage. Do the work this week. Spend some time reading through 1 Corinthians 12 on your own. You will hear and see something different and be blessed by it. So we're going to fast forward down to verse 26 real quick. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together with it. Paul is adamant about the unity of the body. He's so adamant about the unity of the body that he reminds us that something that happens to the hand is felt in the head. I'll say it like this. The ear may receive the extraordinary music that we have heard this morning, but as the ear receives it, the entire soul is lifted up. In the same way, the mouth might receive the chips and queso, which is the height of culinary achievement, But the whole body is sustained by it. Rejoice together in the same way. The toothache takes you down. Your whole self down. If you've had a toothache, you know this. It may affect only one part, but it takes the whole thing down. In the same way, a broken foot prevents the whole body from moving forward. In our family, we say win together and lose together. It's been our constant refrain to our kids to remember That one person's victory isn't your loss, and one person's loss is also not your victory. That we win together and we lose together. Rejoice and grieve together is what Paul says. And we'll finish with the next verse. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And Paul has said it wrong. What Paul meant to say is y'all. Y'all are the body of Christ. Look in the Greek, it's the plural version of the pronoun you, which is properly pronounced y'all are the body of Christ and individually members of it, which is a way of saying y'all are all together. All y'all are together. And every one of you is crucial, is vital to the life of the body. Every one of you, if we are to be the community with a cause for which we were created, it will require every single one of you to be exactly who God made you to be. It will require of us, collectively and individually, that we deploy the gifts that God has given us in the service, not even of Mount Pisgah, but in the service of the kingdom of God. It cannot be any other way. The cause for which we were created, for the, for the representation of a divine reality, 
for the multiplication of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for the stewardship of the world around us, the cause for which we were created, can only be fulfilled if every one of you comes to the table. That's why I love hearing stories like the toolbox ministry. There are eight folks from this church, and I don't even know who they are. How terrible is that? There are eight folks from this church who are showing up at Hillside Elementary to teach kids how to woodwork. Now, now woodworking is not the same thing as the gospel, but showing up for a kid who needs an adult to show up and say, I see you and I love you, that's gospel work. Since we had like 15 babies last week or maybe the week before last in the nursery, we didn't have enough volunteers. There are people who show, who show up, who need to show up simply to sit with the babies of this church so that they are loved and their parents have a chance to invest in their spiritual lives. As there are people in this room who have given small and large financial gifts so that the body might be healthy. God, every day I hear stories of how you're showing up. And I want to encourage you by saying it's the only path forward. The only way we can be the body of Christ is by offering our whole selves individually and collectively to the work of God in Jesus Christ. That is our cause. Let's pray. God, we give you thanks for this commissioning that you've given your church. We're grateful, O oh God, that Paul used such a profound image to describe who we are. And I pray, O oh God, that as we plumb the depths of that metaphor, as we consider all that it might mean for how we show up as a church and how we show up as your followers, I pray that you would open our eyes to the incredible opportunities that you've given us represent you in this world, to steward your world, to multiply the works of the gospel, that everyone with whom we come in contact might know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you love them, that everyone that comes across our path this week might hear and see that your love knows no bounds as evidenced by your work in your son, Jesus Christ, in whom we pray all these things. Amen.